Good morning and welcome to Cree Church Online. So glad we can come together through the internet and to worship our Lord as we gather together as the people of God to give glory and honor to Him through Jesus Christ. The call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 32, verse 11. And this is the Word of God to the people of God. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we pray that our hearts, affections would be directed toward you, that we would exalt you and give you glory and honor through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we commit this service into your hands. And we pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to meet with you. And Lord, that we would truly worship you in spirit and in truth. So, Lord, we commit this service uh, to you through our Lord and Savior, and we give you the glory in advance for all things, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. sisters, please join with me as we profess our faith with one another. And this uh, profession of faith comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 86. So I'll ask the question, and then, like I said, with me, we'll voice this joyous response to the Lord. Since then, we are redeemed from our misery by grace through Christ. Without any merit of ours, why must we do good works? And let's say this together. Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, renews us also by his Holy Spirit after his own image, that with our whole life we may show ourselves thankful to God for his blessing, and that he may be glorified through us, then also that we ourselves may be assured of our faith by the fruits therefore." and by our godly walk may win others also to Christ. Praise be to him. Let's continue singing. (laughs) 
when I fear. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter will prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hope through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, He must hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Those he saves are his life. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. For by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He won't. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Five through 43 is the account where Jesus heals a blind beggar. This man who had no sight since Jesus was passing by and shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And as the narrative unfolds, the blind man was rebuked for what he said, but it didn't stop him. Scripture says he cried out even more. After being brought near Christ, Jesus states, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. As this newly seen man left Jesus, Scripture says that upon his sight being recovered, he immediately followed him, glorifying God. This next song is about coming to Jesus. Coming to him, meaning surrendering to him, making him the source of your power, knowledge, and strength. Even in our weakness, sorrow, and joy, we get to experience the glory of Jesus because of what he has done on the cross. Know that Jesus is near, and he is calling your name, calling you to come and have 
faith in him, Christian. Let's continue in worship. Weak and wounded sinner, lost and left to die. Raise your head for love is passing by. A come to Jesus, a come to Jesus, a come to Jesus. Your burdens lifted, carry far away. And precious blood has washed away the sin. So sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus. Like a newborn baby, don't be afraid to grow. Remember when you are sometimes before. So fall on Jesus, so fall on Jesus. Sky is dark and pours with rain. I cry to Jesus. I cry to Jesus. I cry to Jesus. And then when the love spills over. Music fills the night, and when you can't reach, can sing your joy inside. The dance with Jesus, dance with Jesus, dance with Jesus. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our source, our strength, we ask that you work within us, Lord, our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we surrender to you, that we come to you full heart because we love you, Lord. And the only reason we love you is because you died on the cross for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, by your spirit, we just ask that you open our eyes and our hearts to hear the preaching of your word. And as we hear it, Lord, let your word dwell in us richly, Lord, so that we may leave here today and teach and admonish one another with all wisdom in our hearts, Lord. Thank you. 
thank you for your mercy and grace. And we pray uh, that as we leave here, Lord, that you are with us and always near. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 3 through 4. A sermon I am entitling, Endurance at All Cost. Endurance at All Cost, from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 through 4. And this is the Word of God to the people of God. Consider him who endured from, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, and we pray that it would burn deep in our hearts, and Lord, that you would challenge us, Lord, that we would come to terms with what scripture is telling us about what true Christianity is, Lord, help us and sustain us in the faith. And Lord, that we would be challenged to grow in such a way that is constructive and something that is productive and bringing glory and honor to you through Jesus Christ. So Lord, use your word in our hearts and be glorified in the preaching of your word. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, we have seen that the writer of Hebrews has been challenging these first century Christians to look to Jesus, who is the founder and perfecter of our faith. He is the one who shows us what it means to endure hardships in the world while maintaining joy by being focused on the eternal plans and purposes of God. Our joy must be rooted in eternity, and the temporal aspects of the world are not a lasting substitute for us. It will only be a matter of time before we will become disenchanted and disappointed with the material world. This is why when we finally get the things that we think will make us happy, in a short time, we, we are joyless and looking to something else in the world to cultivate a sense of joy back into our lives again. We're looking away from what we gain, thinking would make us happy, and looking in the direction of something else. But the pursuit of eternal joy is not like that, because the plan and purposes of God are unchanging. When our sanctification leading to our glorification in Christ is the primary objective, then we look at trials in the world completely different. We look at the trials in the world at the benefit that comes to us through those trials. We see the suffering that we know God is sovereign over, and we know that the suffering is producing a glory factor where we are being changed and Christ is being glorified in and through our lives. Now, last Sunday, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, directed us to see Jesus as our example. And in verses 3 through 4, the writer of Hebrews doesn't point us to any other place. As a matter of fact, he is still focusing our attention, our eyes, upon our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But here in our text, he actually calls us to contemplate Christ and his example even deeper, but in a way that challenges us in our battle against sin. Look back at verse 3 where we are challenged to consider Christ as we face trials and suffering in the world. Back to your text, the first half of verse 3, we see these words, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. Now the term here, consider, in the original language is actually calling us to go beyond a casual reflection. It is the only place in the all of Scripture where this word is actually being used. We are being called into careful deliberation concerning Christ and His suffering. 
specifically in the way Christ suffered at the hands of sinners. He who had, could have called legions of angels to deliver him, with a single word, he could have obliterated all those who were inflicting the hostility upon him, but instead he actually endured the suffering and the hostility that was coming upon him as he was actually hung on a cross. When you think of the cosmic power and the absolute justice by which he sovereignly rules, then you contrast that with the sinful defiance of the ones who were hostile towards him and actually contributed to his crucifixion. It defies all logic from the human standpoint, defies all logic that such an event could ever take place, that God would actually allow such an event like that to actually take place, an event where the creature actually exercises hostility of such magnitude of crucifying his creator. That must rank in the top tier of the most absurd criminal injustices for all time. And yet, like a sheep before his shears is silent, the Lord of glory uttered not a word. And this was prophesied about him in Isaiah 53, verse 7. So this theological understanding of the sufferings of Christ is what the writer of Hebrews calls us to think deeply about because there is a practical benefit of application to us that serves to encourage us as children in the world, as his children in the world. Look at the end of verse 3 through verse 4. It's what I'm calling the application of the sufferings of Christ in the second half of verse 3 through verse 4, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So the death the in-depth theological focus on Christ and His suffering has a very practical purpose tied to it in the life of the believing Christian. And we see it right there at the end of verse 3. So that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted as you live out your faith in the world. The two terms, weary and faint-hearted, in the original language cover both the physical, and the emotional challenges that we can face as Christians in this life, as we live in the world. Christ pursued suffering out of a quest for eternal joy, but our tendency as fallen people, our tendency is to grow weary and to grow faint-hearted when we suffer through trials in the world. And it is so true that if you follow Christ, as Scripture details, you will run into opposition in this world. If you believe and proclaim that Jesus is full deity and the exclusion and only, the exclusive and only way that sinful man can be reconciled to a holy God, you will encounter opposition in the world. And if you are looking for the world's approval, you may actually be tempted then to just disregard what the Bible teaches about the exclusivity of Christ in order to fit in with the world and to avoid the opposition that may arise because of your testimony in Christ. If you hold to the exclusivity of Christ as the only way of salvation— you can bet on it that hostility is coming in an ever-increasing measure and the tendency to become weary and faint-hearted will increase right along with it as well. But it seems to me that Hebrews is not primarily directing us toward our struggles at the hands of others here in the world. I, I don't think that that's what the writer of Hebrews is primarily focusing on. Certainly that happens. It, it, it is coming. And, and many are rightly concerned about this going on in the world. Uh, but it is not the front lines of the battle for a Christian in a sinful world. The front lines of our battle with sin is with the sinful impulses that we struggle with inside each and every one of us. 
if you just read on in Hebrews chapter 12, it becomes very apparent which battle here is being emphasized. And Lord willing, we'll see more of this next Sunday more clearly. But as for now, uh, just refer to the instruction in verse 4. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Uh, the writer of Hebrews believes that we will struggle in this world with sin. There will be a battle going on in this world, in the Christian's life, with sin. And it is a battle that we should uh, actively be engaged in. Even the external opposition that we may encounter from others in the world can be for our good in bringing to light our own sinful tendencies that we love to believe are really not that big of a deal uh, in our eyes. And, and sometimes we like to pretend that God feels the same way about our sinful indulgences as we do. That God doesn't really think that our sin, that we practice as Christians, without even sometimes even giving a second thought to it, that God doesn't really see those types of things as big deals either. Well, the Bible tells us that Christ shed his blood for our sin. If you know anything about the gospel, you would have to say that, that God sees our sin as a major problem to the degree that he was willing to send his own son into the world to die in the place of sinners, to, to redeem us from our sin and its effects. Christ shed his blood for our sin, but our resistance has not yet risen to the height of what Christ was willing to do on our behalf. And the writer of Hebrews points that out. Christ endured it for us, and the fact that he did should drive us on in our battle against our own sin in the world. We do not make atonement for sin in our battle. And that is not what I'm saying. Only Christ makes atonement for us. Only he atones for our sin. But what we do do is we are to pursue sanctifying holiness to the glory of God in Christ as we live out our lives in the world. Christ did not die for sin in order to enable you, Christian, to continue to live on in that sin. The gospel is not the great enablement for you to continue on in your sin. He died to liberate you from the bondage of sin and empower you to live victoriously over it by the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Certainly, He died to justify you before a holy God, that God might declare you righteous simply on the finished work of Christ and the finished work of Christ being applied to your life. He died to justify you before a holy God and to reconcile you to himself. But he also died to liberate your will and to empower you to be free to walk in righteousness. It's popular today in so-called Christian circles to embrace what Martin Luther referred to as antinomianism. And you say, oh my goodness, Pastor Brett, that's a huge word. I mean, I can't hardly stand words like that. Antinomianism, what is that? Well, it's just a big word that means anti-law or against the law. Nomos is law, anti-against instead of. Uh, it's a Greek term meaning no law or anti-law. And the idea is that someone can profess Christianity and then live as they please, that God is not concerned about the Christian sin any longer in how they live their life. The moral law demands are seen as unnecessary in antinomianism and are often labeled as legalistic directives that are obsolete in the new covenant. And this view was also present in the early church in a different form, but it was largely being promoted in that day by the Gnostics who argued for a radical distinction between soul and body, where the only thing that really mattered is what was done spiritually. What was done in the body was not that big of a deal. You could sin, live your life how you wanted. It was the soul or spirit that would be saved in the end. And so you, whatever you did in this body of flesh was really null and void, didn't make that much uh, didn't make that much of a difference. 
In such circles today, there is an emphasis certainly on free grace, but the effectual nature of grace is largely denied. Salvation by faith is necessary, but repentance, uh, not so much. Uh, One can profess Christianity, but turning from sin in such circles is largely seen as optional. For the antinomians, preaching against sin is seen as a negative and unnecessary thing to do. So in the end, what gets interpreted as Christianity is not really Christianity at all. It is a distortion of Christianity. Real Christianity and the real gospel then gets preached in such context, and it sounds like law because repentance is preached and sanctification is preached, and the antinomians' ears pick up on it, and they slanderously call it legalism, but in truth it is actually the real gospel of the Bible. The idea of resisting sin is not a popular notion in a society that has as its highest end to live for its own comforts and pleasures in the world. The real gospel is very offensive to such an idea, where the antinomian gospel can be embraced and think that it's no problem, no issue. I can continue on in doing exactly what I want to do and still be a Christian and go to heaven in the end. When the truth is, Someone who holds to such views doesn't really believe the true gospel of the Bible. And there are people in the world who hold to this antinomian gospel. Some speculate that it is the largest held belief within so-called Christian circles in America today. And those in the world actually prefer a church and a gospel where such things like sinful indulgence is accommodated. An antinomian mindset infects everyone in its path as long as the true gospel is kept from being preached and lived out. It fits so well with man's nature, and it's very affirming in a religious sort of way, but yet it doesn't really confront the depths of our sinful depravity and sanctify us down to our core. Christian, you need to resolve it in your heart that you would know the real gospel of the Bible And if you do, then you know that the appeal is not that law is rejected, but that law is fulfilled in Christ, and the moral aspects of the law still confront us and direct us to the gospel again and again and again and again. Uh, The law is like a schoolmaster, as as a schoolmaster directs the the behavior of the child. The, The law addresses the behavior of the Christian and brings them back again to the fulfillment of the gospel and to assurance of the grace and forgiveness of God. So it does this to not only confront our sin, but to bring us to the fountain of God's grace revealed in the gospel. And this dynamic is sanctifying us as the children of God by weaning us off of self-reliance and onto faith in Jesus Christ and reliance on Christ and His gospel for our lives. And we must remember that the real gospel is initiated in the hearts of men by a holy and sovereign God. It is His grace that He initiates that by. Though arguments are sometimes made in evangelistic conversation or in preaching of the Word of God when the gospel is being preached, the work of regeneration is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit of God initiating divine grace in the hearts and lives of the lost sinner. And it is not culturally savvy arguments that appeal to the sinful comforts and pleasures of men that bring people to the point of salvation. Uh, We do not need to think of that as preachers or evangelists, uh, that somehow in our argumentation that they came to believe the gospel. Uh, such, Such an idea is foolishness because it is God who is the one who regenerates lost sinners, uh, but we should actually marvel that he actually used us to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the unbeliever who was born again. But it's not the savvy nature of the argumentation of the evangelist. It is the work of God. 
initiated by His Holy Spirit, regenerating the sinner, liberated to believe the gospel freely offered in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that it is the gospel that is the power of God for salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And that gospel calls us to believe by faith alone, which, is, which produces repentance of our sin in obedience to God as fruit of, its, of the gospel's effective work having been done in us. Grace is effectual. Grace brings transformation. It brings change and transformation in the life of the regenerated person. And it produces good works and the fruit of the Spirit in us. The problem is that taking our sanctification seriously and believing that the gospel produces the fruit of repentance is hard work. And we see this as a problem because it's very difficult to be busy about sanctification and to turn away from our sin. And it can be very tiring and in an already difficult and draining world. We want a refuge for our lives. And we like to come to the church thinking that it's the church's job to give us that refuge in our lives. A refuge from the cares of the world where all those cares are dealt with. Sort of like that old TV commercial. If you have gray hair, you'll probably remember it. Where the woman comes home at the end of a hard day of work as she walks through the door. And the dog is barking. And the kids are screaming. And the phone is ringing. All at the same time. And then all of a sudden as she shuts the door and she's carrying the bag of groceries, she leans back on the door in total exhaustion. And the bottom falls out of the bags of her groceries all over the floor. And at that very moment, she looks up in the air and puts her hand up to her forehead and screams out as loud as she can, Calgon, take me away! In the next scene, we see that she is in a Calgon bubble bath, quiet, sitting in the tub, with soft music playing in the background. And you think about that old commercial from years gone by, and you think about it in a spiritual context, and, and you may be picking up on it at this very moment where you're like, oh yes, yes, Pastor Brett, that's it, that's it. Get, get this, get this, understand this, Pastor Brett. That is exactly what we want out of our Christianity and we want church service on Sunday morning and you preaching to be that cow God take me away moment from all the cares and the trials and the difficulties of this life that we have faced throughout the week. I want a bath that does that very thing for me. It takes away all my difficulties and hardships in the world. It makes everything better and allows me to be able to function in a way that manages all of my problems. Well, Christian, as your pastor, I don't know how to break this to you, but your biggest problems and issues really is not your stress level in a hectic world. Oh, I know you may be tempted to think that, that it's all the stuff that you find unmanageable that, that are the problems. If, if the church or the pastor could just somehow fix those things, well, then life would be wonderful and, and everything would be, uh, be okay with me and, and we could actually have uh, like a utopia on earth. Have you ever noticed that when you get problems that are facing you solved, that it's not long before new problems come along? It's, it's not very long at all. Actually, it happens relatively quickly. There, there may be a brief break or a brief season where things seem pretty good, but then all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere, if it's not you directly, it's someone that you love, that you care for, that's going through times of difficulty. You see, Christian, your biggest issue and problem is not your stress level in a hectic world, 
but it is actually your contentment with your own sin. And the life challenges that you're going through are exposing prideful elements in you and in me that are an offense to a holy God. And you see, I can stand here and tell you that, but it'll take the trials and difficulties of the world to get you and your life to connect the dots. Where you see the trial that you went through, the things that God taught you, and, and you look back and you're like, you're like man, it's, it could have happened no other way. Uh, there, there's no way I could have learned that. There's no way that that could have been sanctified out of my life without that trial, without that difficulty. Man, God did something great and amazing through all that. And those prideful elements are so deeply rooted in us that it's hard for us to pick up on them because they're such a part of who we are in our nature. And we don't think about their offense against a holy God. And we continue to live out those impulses in what we might call as humans big and small ways, but yet they are all offensive to God. You see, that's our big issue. That's really our big issue. And it's hard for us to see it when we live out what is relevant to us. Because if it's relevant to us, we will look at our life and where we're at as being the place of normalcy and perfection. And not how it's relevant to how God sees it. And being in denial about that is not helping us at all. A Calgon bubble bath, as good as it might feel, is not going to address the problem of the issue of sin on the inside of us. You see, Christian, it takes a bath in the blood of Christ to cleanse us of that stain. A uh, Calgon cannot do anything. Uh, the antinomian gospel is not able to, it, it may make us feel better about ourselves, but the antinomian gospel uh, will not address sin at that level in our hearts. It will take the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us of that stain at that level, to do surgery that deep within our hearts. It takes the real gospel of Jesus Christ, the real biblical gospel of Jesus Christ applied to confront sin at the depth of our prideful hearts to get at the core of who we really are down in our natures. It takes the blood of Jesus when trials reveal the depth of our depravity, when we would rather be in denial and embrace antinomianism to keep us depending on the, on the provision of God's grace. We'd rather be denial, in denial about it. Antinomianism might make you feel more comfortable, but it's not the gospel of the Bible. It isn't the power of God for salvation, but a generic adaptation to fit with the expectations of fallen man. It is not a gospel that, that can actually confront man in his sin and, and bring him to the place of repentance and, and empower him for true saving faith. As a matter of fact, I would add that you might as well be taking a Calgon bubble bath, literally. <laughs> The law itself may expose you, but the love of Christ revealed in the true gospel has all that you need and that I need to deal with anything that we have going on at the deepest levels of our heart where we struggle with sin so much, and yet it's so hard for us to see it there. You see, Christian, it's a comforting thought to know that Jesus Christ, when He hung on the cross 2,000 years ago, He actually knew you and He knew me. And He knew all the sin, the whole package deal that came with us. And yet He still died in our place to redeem us and to ransom us for God. He knew all about our skeletons in our closet. 
And He died in your place anyway, and He calls you away from your sin to confess it to God and to know that He is faithful and just to cleanse you of all your unrighteousness, Christian, that you might find your acceptance in Him and rest for your souls. And the law? Well, it's kind of like that schoolmaster that's trying to drive you in the right direction to get you to go to the place where God has all that you need through Christ Jesus and, and to come to terms with that as a believer for your life as you live out your life each and every day. Oh, the trials may expose the dross in our lives, but it is the gospel that is the answer to the impurities in our life and in our hearts. Why don't you come to terms with that today as a believer in Jesus Christ? May you rest in the sufficiency of all that Christ is for you. And may you confess your sin to God, turn away from it, and come to Him and rest in His sovereign grace. You may be listening today and not a believer in Jesus Christ. And my friend, you don't need a bath in a tub with Calgon in it. You don't need a cheap trick where the gospel is molded and shaped in such a way as not to confront the reality of your sin in your life. You need the real gospel because it's the only one that's going to save sinners to the uttermost. And it's that gospel that you need to put your faith in, that you need to trust in Christ, that you might believe the gospel and that you too might be saved. Sinner, you need the blood of Christ Unbeliever, you need this bath in the finished work of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Put your faith in Him and believe the gospel today that you may rest in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just thank You for the truth of this text, for all that we see in Hebrews chapter 12. Lord, it's just so fun to preach this and to see it and see it so clearly laid out for us. As we think about this time that we're going through and this battle with coronavirus and all the uncertainty and the trials and difficulties that we're facing, and for some it's even to a greater scale than just coronavirus. It's other illness, sickness, difficulties, financial issues. Lord, the whole gambit of things that go on in a fallen world. And our tendency, Lord, so often is to find assurance, Lord, in something that is in the making of our own hands. And yet these trials remind us that we are simply not in control, that You are the only one who is sovereign and not ourselves. So, Lord, we come to You with all the trials and difficulties and all the uncertainty, all of our fears, all the anxieties. And, Lord, we lay them before Your feet. And we are reminded, Lord, that You knew about them before the very foundations of the world. And You know their beginning, You know their end, and You know their purpose. I pray, Lord, that right now, as believers, that You would bring us to the point that we would rest in Your grace in spite of these trials and the difficulties that we face. May our reliance not be upon ourselves, but upon You. May our confidence be upon You. Forgive us when we trust in the works of our hands or look to something in the world that we think that will sustain us when, Lord, it just simply will not. Father, I pray that as You expose those insecurities and that pride in our hearts. Lord, I pray that You would bring us to the point of seeing how our struggle is so much about a battle between trusting You and living in our own assurance. Father, forgive us. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness that we might walk in Your ways that You might be glorified, Lord, in the midst of Your church. Lord, may we not be caught up by all the cares of the world. Forgive us for our idolatry. 
And Lord, if there be anyone within the sound of my voice that, who, that is listening today who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that today may be the day that their eyes may be opened to the truth of the gospel. And Lord, that they would be saved unto salvation. And for those who are believers, Lord, I pray that you would guard our hearts against antinomian beliefs and thoughts and tendencies. Lord, there's nothing in our lives that your gospel is not sufficient to address. There's nothing that we go through that your sovereign grace is not able to carry us through. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be reminded of that. And Lord, I know it is an easy thing to sit here and proclaim it as true as we can see it on the pages of Scripture. It is very hard and difficult for us to live through it. But yet, Lord, I pray that your grace would prevail and our confidence and our anchor in you would be sufficient to help us, Lord. Help us to keep our focus. Lord, heal our bodies for those who are sick. We pray for healing strength. We pray for safety for our families. We pray for your hand of protection over your church around the globe. Lord, that you would keep us from all harm, but at the same time that you would grow us through the trials and difficulties. Be with world leaders as they make decisions regarding the pandemic and be with our doctors and nurses and first responders, Lord, as they minister to so many. And Lord, we pray for their protection as well and healing for bodies. Pray for our own president that you would guide him. We pray that you would take the political steam out of the issues and trials that we go through here in our country. Lord, that we would be able as the people here in this nation to come to terms with the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, that you would bring a great revival in America. The sinners might turn to you for salvation and rest in the assurance of the finished work of Jesus Christ revealed in the gospel. Father, give us discernment that we might not only be able to guard our hearts against antinomianism, but that we would guard our hearts against any false doctrine or heresy that would come against us as your covenant people. Father, do your work. Continue to advance your kingdom in the world. And may you be glorified in your church through Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask all these things in His precious name. Amen. On a hill, on a hill far away, stood an no rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest stand back for a world of lost sinner was slain. So I cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies and last I lay Love me, I'm
shame and reproach gladly bear. Sing it to him. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glories forever I'll share. So I cherish the old rugged cross. Yes. Till my trophies and lines I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. And exchange it someday for a crown. I will cling. I will cling. And now receive the benediction from the book of Numbers, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Confess their sheaves are